Welcome to Adventure Freaks, a podcast on living abroad on a budget. Today, I am with Debbie Skirm, and Debbie, Debbie is, she lives in Spain. So we go all the way to Spain, and it's, and it's an amazing place and an amazing country, and I know this firsthand. I spent, I spent um, a summer in Spain and had the time of my life. Um, Debbie is a celebrant and her company is called Celebrant Spain and she was awarded the best celebrant in Europe. And so that she is incredibly impressive. She has a website. We're going to share that at the end of the podcast. She's going to talk a little bit about what she does. She lives in this beautiful area uh, of Spain. It's the Southern coast. Um, coast called La Herradura. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, the horseshoe. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and um, so, and she's gonna she's gonna share her insights of living in Spain and living as an expat in Spain. She originates from England, and um, so my first question, um, Debbie, is how did you how did you find Spain, and how did you decide to become an expat? Living <laughs> I hate the word expat. Uh -oh. so good, thank you very, very much for having me on. I am passionate about Spain and I want to encourage everybody to, to come over here. But uh, expat, no, I'm an immigrant. So I think expat has its origins in British colonial days and it has connotations of people that are above other people and I am I am not I am just so grateful to Spain for welcoming me and accepting me just like all the other eclectic people that you'll find here locally from different parts of Europe Canada Australia all over the world but we're all immigrants we've all moved here and Spain has been so welcoming so I'm not I'm not um unpatriotic um I don't ever want to go back to Britain, apart from to see my grandchildren. But uh, yeah, I'm not an expat per se. I prefer mm. immigrant. I, I love that. I love how you define that. Seriously, that's I, I never even thought about it that way. So you just gave me a whole new perspective on how to see that. Yeah. And it's and it's very true. It, it, I think that there are, um, you know, I've been interviewing a lot of people and this is really, it's been an exciting adventure for me and you know that everybody uses the word expat and there are some some people that do that do move into another country and they don't really connect with that country or the people or anything they just build a a community exclusive to mm -hmm. expats and they don't yeah. learn the language they don't really dive into the to the to the food or the you know it's a it's a different yeah. way of living but they do it um you know, they obviously there's intentions behind why they do that, but it doesn't make sense for me to move to another country and not want to be be a part of that country and that culture in some way. Yeah, I call them the fry and die, fry and die crowd. They come over here to Spain for our wonderful weather and they just sunbathe all day long, drink gin and tonics and then they die. They don't achieve anything. You yeah. know, they've arrived. Their journey has stopped. Yeah, yeah. So they're missing out. And I mean, you know, from being in Nerja, which is just 10 minutes up the road, that we're only at the, at the shortest point, we're just 14 kilometers from Africa. Yes. So Africa is very close. And on a clear day, you can see Africa. Yes. So if somebody comes over from Morocco, they're called an immigrant. Somebody comes over from the UK, they're called an expat. No, we're both the same. We're both exactly the same. Yes. So the Moroccans are making their life here. I'm making my life here. We're all immigrants in the same boat. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah well, thank you. I love that. That's thank you for that clarification. It's awesome. And, I, and it's so true. Um, so true. So tell us, um, tell us about your your life and um, tell us a little bit about like how you became a celebrant a celebrant and and what that is for the people who don't know and how do you do that how do you become it i know that people that here in the states um the people that 
you, you know, unite people in marriage, they, they become ordained. And I know people that are actually doing this on a, on a, the quick version online now, where you can do it within a few hours and become ordained and they're officiating some of their friends. And I think that's kind of neat and it's cool. It's kind of a movement. Um, but how do you become a celebrant in Spain and what's involved in that? Okay, I think in America, you probably call me a wedding officiant. So um, back in the UK, uh, since 2005, I was a registrar. So I was registering legal births and deaths and marriages. So that's my background. I do have a, a legal background as a registrar. And then when I came over to Spain, all oh, about 12 years ago now, um, I actually moved to inland Spain, which I'll tell you all about in just a minute, which is very different to where I am now. And in inland Spain, there were no other English speakers who we were completely immersed in the culture there, living way, way up in the mountains on the edge of a little village. So I didn't have the opportunity there and I didn't actually have the, the finances at that time to set myself up in business. So when we moved to the coast three years ago, to southern Spain, where there are plenty more English speakers, not only living here, but people that journey here to Spain, then it became a great opportunity to set myself up as a celebrant and I officiate symbolic wedding ceremonies. So even in America, you can separate contracting your legal marriage from your wedding celebration. You can separate your marriage from your wedding if you want to, which then frees you up to have a wedding ceremony wherever you want. It could be on top of a mountain, um, in a castle, a palace, a private villa, on the beach, wherever you want it to be. So that was my idea. I'd done the kind of stressful legal bit in the UK. And then I saw an opportunity just to solely concentrate on the wedding ceremony. So nowadays, the majority of my couples, they contract their legal marriage at home. So you'll get your, your marriage license in America or Canada, Australia, wherever you're coming from. You'll get legally married there, very unromantic. We just do the, the legal contract. And then you come over to Spain and what I'll do is I'll create a, a wedding ceremony for you wherever you want it to be with as many people or as few people as you want. And uh, I'm in the business of making dreams come true. People pay me to do it. They give me champagne. I do it in the sunshine. I've got the best job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it. I mean, sign me up, man. I'm like... <laughs> Great. And I travel with my job. I'm able to travel all over Spain as well. So um, I'll have somebody call me up in Madrid or Barcelona or Sevilla, Malaga, Cordoba, all over. So and they pay me to travel as well. So it really is wonderful. I absolutely love it. Yeah. And I noticed that, you know, you're you're bilingual so that you you speak Spanish and you I'm sure you officiate a lot of Spanish weddings as well. So you're you're accommodating both sides of the, the the mix right yeah traditionally the the spanish have a, a catholic culture here so they would traditionally have a religious wedding but there are more and more local people that are now wanting an alternative not everybody is religious but they're perhaps very spiritual so they want something that's meaningful as well as magical and having some lovely photos of course but the, this is where i can come in um, and also you'll find that a lot of people you have multicultural marriages. So you might have um, a Hindu family marrying into a Catholic family, mm. and it's very difficult. Just you don't want to convert to the other's religion. So what do you do? So I can create hybrid wedding ceremonies, and we can respectfully bring in rituals from both sides and mm. create something that both sides of the family are happy with. And then perhaps have a, an actual unity ritual within there Perhaps it could be a sand blending where we have two different colors of sand and one family pours it into the container, the other family pours the other color. And the idea being just so you can't ever separate those grains of sand, you can now never separate that unified family. And it brings together cultures and families and beliefs and yeah. there's some lovely rituals out there, very wow. visual things. And, yeah, it, well, it gives me goosebumps just talking about it. I love it. Well, it does. It sounds incredible. And it sounds so educational. I mean, you're learning so much about the different the differences in cultures. And then you're bringing the and unifying these different cultures coming together. 
yeah. and and you're and you're putting it all together so yes. it's, that's just yeah. yeah that would be really fun do you have the expression to tie the knot um yeah yeah do you know where that comes from no okay well if you think back um before people could read or write but they wanted to let the community know that they were then a couple that they had chosen to commit to being together as husband and wife what they would do is they would put their pulses together and then hold wrists and somebody would wrap a cord or a ribbon or a length of material around and bind them together and then as you pull your hands away and hold on to each end it forms an infinity knot and you're tying the knot. You're literally tying the knot of matrimony. Wow. So uh, hand fastening is what we call it these days. Yeah. So we can bring hand fastening into your ceremony as well. And again, that's a lovely visual representation of committing to be together and, and saying your promises and your vows on your special day. Yeah. Wow. Have you had anybody do that particular ritual? Lots. A, and they yeah. choose all kinds of things to have as the cord. Um, I've had dog leads, climbing ropes. Um, there was a couple that had the hems off their mother's wedding dresses, and that was lovely. That was a lovely symbol. Mm. Um, I've got a couple coming up that are Scottish, and they've each got their own tartan ribbon. So we're going to unify the clans, tie the knots together with the two different ribbons. So yeah, all different types of things, all different kinds of ideas. Um, there's also Ilo Rojo. Ilo Rojo is the red thread of destiny. Mm -hmm. And that has its origins back in Asian culture. And if you think you have a, a vein, it said you have a vein in your little finger that goes all the way to your heart. Mm. And the idea is you have a, a red thread that you tie around the one partner, their little finger, and the other end around the other partner's little finger. And in Asian culture, it's said that you have an invisible red thread that will connect you to your soulmate forever. And you may not meet initially, you may not meet, or you might meet and part, but eventually you will be drawn together. And this invisible red thread, it can bend, um, it can stretch, but it will never break. And eventually you will be pulled together. So we can do a, a red thread of destiny ceremony for you as mm. well. And uh, that, that's absolutely lovely. Does that, is that idea um, mean that if you have absolutely no clue who your soulmate is, that there, you are still connected by this invisible red thread that will eventually um, make who that person is uh, um, come yeah. to, into your... Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you will be drawn together. Um, I've met several couples who were childhood sweethearts very much the early days when they were very young and then they separated went their separate ways perhaps had different partners different families even and then ultimately they've been drawn back together so they are true soulmates mm. and they're all oh, some lovely stories really yeah lovely. yeah well that sounds really awesome man I, I that's really very cool so I'm 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 glad that that you you're doing this because it, it it's just it's I'm very excited for you and I'm almost like going that would be really fun to do. And you can renew your vows as well, mm. um, particularly the the people that are coming on world tours and European tours. They'll stop off in one of the historic cities in Spain, and we'll go up to say the Alhambra Palace or the Mesquita in Cordoba somewhere, you know, very beautiful that oozes history. Sure. And they'll recommit themselves to each other because, you know, life happens, life changes you, and perhaps the promises you first made are not the promises that you would make today. You've changed as people. Perhaps you've had a family. Perhaps you've had difficulties. Um, perhaps you've had health issues, whatever. But mm -hmm. everybody has a different reason for wanting to recommit to their partner. Sure. And um, we can do some beautiful yeah. vow renewal ceremonies as well. Those yeah, are yeah. yeah, cool, cool. So how many pla different places have you lived um, in Spain? Oh, uh, when I first moved to Spain, I lived in high end province. And then I moved to Cordoba. And now I'm in Granada. So 11 or 12 years ago, I didn't have very much money. And the coast is much more expensive than uh, inland Spain. So this is about two hours drive inland. And there's a, the province of Jaén is one of the poorest provinces 
that we have in southern Spain, in Andalusia, in the region of Andalusia. Um, and so consequently, properties there are very cheap, very, very reasonable. Um, you can get an olive farm for about 48,000 euros, mm -hmm. which, is, which is very reasonable. And if you want to live off grid, uh, you can find a property that has its own well, you can put in solar paneling, so you've got your own electricity. And it's very, very easy to live very economically in central Spain. And so we started off in high-end province. Um, and then we moved to um, Cordoba province. And this is where we've spent the majority of our time. And we were up in the Sierra Subetica, which is um, an, a mountain area living on the edge of a village. And it was like time had stood still. Um, it's like the UK was between the wars, between the First and Second World War, where everybody's door was always open. Um, you only had to change your mind and somebody knew about it. There was no such thing as, as privacy. Um, Neighbourhood watch, everybody looking out for each other. But there were people in the valley that had never been out of the valley, ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we still had people with mules. That was their means of transport, um, where the mule would live inside the house. So the mule would be in the downstairs room and because of the, the, the excrement and the, the heat generated from that, that would then warm the upstairs rooms. Mm. Um, it's a very traditional lifestyle. So we didn't have glass in the windows of our house for five years because traditionally we don't. People couldn't afford glass. Mm -hmm. uh, we would go down to minus eight degrees in winter, which is pretty cold, but we'd be really cozy with the, the wooden shutters you know, a wood burning fire inside. Mm -hmm. um, the community would all get together in November for what they call matanza. And any vegetarians do this, go la la la. This is the, the pig killing season. Mm. So you go to a, a neighbor's farm, all the community goes to the neighbor's farm. Um, you kill the pig, you make all the different sausages and you preserve the meat in a way that doesn't need refrigeration. Uh, it doesn't need to be put into a freezer. It's all traditional methods. Mm -hmm. So and that takes two days. And then the next couple of days, you'll go to another farm. And so uh, the whole valley smells of sausages. Yeah, yeah. For about a month. Uh, but yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. And it pulls everybody together. Everybody works alongside of each other. Mm -hmm. So those are very, very special days, very special times. Um, but I really learned the value of water. So for me, water is more precious than anything. When you've only got a well, you count every single drop. I mean, here I am now in the, the Costa Tropical. I turn my tap on and you know, I don't think twice about it. But there, oh, every single drop counted. And mm -hmm. we would recycle all our water as well. So all of the water from our showers um, would go out onto the, the vegetable patch. And it was a very, very precious commodity. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you have that different is... values when you're living very close to nature like that. Yeah, for sure. Let me pull up a, the I'm going to pull up the Google map to mm -hmm. give people um, a view of where you're located in Spain and what you were just talking about. So here is Spain. Um, OK, and then we're going to zoom back in. So you can see how close Africa is. You see Morocco on it's... the map. It you is. How close Tangier yeah. and Gibraltar are to each other. Yeah, I went. Yeah, I took the. Um, I spent a little time when I spent that summer in Spain. I had to go down to Morocco, so I took. I went over to Cadiz and took the the boat over, and spent a little time down in Morocco, and and that was in, incredibly um, enjoyable as well. Went all the way down to Marrakesh. So you're here, Lahir. Hiradura. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in the car. A few, we're an hour from Malaga. Mm. Um, that's an international airport. And also just north of that, we're an hour from Granada. And okay. Granada, you have the Sierra Nevada, which mm. is the longest ski season in the whole of Europe. So yes, you can come to Spain and yes, you can ski. And not only that, you can ski in the morning. And then just drive down to where you can see the little red pin, and then you can sunbathe in the afternoon at the Costa Tropical because it's a microclimate. So it's yeah. a very special area where I am. Yeah, it is. It's I spent like you and I spoke before we even started recording today, and I spent some time in Nerja, 
and really I spent probably close to I think a week in Nirhan just had a great time spent a little time in Malaga too which is a uh, um, where Antonio Banderas is from. So he's yeah. known for coming from Malaga. Where's Penelope Cruz from in Spain? I don't Do you know? know. Good, Not sure. good question. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, but this is just, this whole region is just absolutely beautiful all the way on up to Valencia. Um, so, yeah. So, so what, let's, let's talk about now, like the cost. So you're, Obviously, you go inland and things are, are very affordable. And I've heard that, th you know, things right now all over Europe are really affordable. Um, you, if you're looking in Portugal, if you're looking in Spain, parts of Italy. I mean, Italy has been known recently for all the one dollar houses, <laughs> you know, one euro houses that they were they were selling. They they needed quite a bit of fix fixing up, but but they were purchased. Um, so there's 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 places all over Europe now that have become really affordable, and I think there's there, there's people that are catching on to this and and moving to these different destinations that most people never really thought of because Europe has kind of always been one of those locations that have been um, out of reach financially for many people. Yes. So what what are the costs now? I mean, what can you get an apartment for, and where are some of the more affordable places? Um, for people to live if they decide to, to live in Spain? Well, if you just see under, under the word museums there, you've got Alcalá La Real. And Al Alcalá La Real attracts a lot of people, a lot of English-speaking people, because it is so cheap there. It is very cheap. Where is that um, at? Uh, under, underneath the word museums. Museums. Alcalá La Real. So go, go up, 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 up. To the top of your screen where you've got attractions museums transit oh Open gotcha yeah okay. so move your move your pointer down and there's alcala lariel just there ah. so and just um top left of that is alcadete and then you've got martos alcadete and martos are super cheap you can get a townhouse in martos or alcadete for about eighteen thousand euros one eight wow very very cheap and you have a, a little town garden with that as well, a little bit of land with that as well. How are so, the how are the communities? I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a person that really enjoys not having to drive anywhere. I love to live in a location where I can just walk. You know, you got a balcony, then I can go down. I can go get a cup of coffee. I can go to the bakery. I can go to the the restaurant, eat some tapas, or you know, whatever, what have you, and just be able to walk to all that. Okay, well, the the area that you're looking at there, that's part of. Um, I mentioned Hayen, Hayen province is is very cheap there. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're moving down, you've got um, Cordoba province. So underneath Hayen is is Cordoba, and then you move into Granada. All of these are actually very cheap provinces to live in. Mm -hmm. And even where I am now, um, because we're not the Costa del Sol with the Costa Tropical, everything is still, it's, the, the properties are more expensive, but the living is the same actually. So for example, you can get a really lovely coffee for a euro, euro 20. Um, if you're buying your beer in the supermarket, it'd be 25 cents for a can. If you want a bottle of Cava, which is like our version of champagne, it's under two euros for a bottle of champagne. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very cheap. And also, if you go to a bar, you'll have a free tapa. Whereas if you go as far as Neha, which is where you were before, which is only about 10 minutes away, you won't necessarily get your free tapa there because that's Costa del Sol and that's a more touristy area. So just staying in the lesser known provinces, it's much, much cheaper. Mm -hmm. And I've got my parents staying with me at the moment. They're in their 80s and they have sussed out where I live. So they know how to walk all the way around the village and have an evening out and be absolutely full by the time they come home and they haven't bought any food at all. They've just had free tap out with their drinks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's really good. And you go to Granada City and you'll still get free tap out. So it's, it's very reasonable, very reasonable place yeah. to live. And, and explain, explain to our viewers what tapas are. <laughs> um, I'm not really 100% sure where the word comes from, but people think that the word tapa is the word for a cover. 
and that people originally put a cover over the top of their drink to keep the flies off. Mm -hmm. And then I don't really understand the logic, but then people would put a piece of bread or um, some jamón, some local ham or something on the plate. And, and now nowadays we just have a, a free little light bite. Mm -hmm. It could be a, a mini hamburger. It mm -hmm. could be a piece of chorizo with some, some salad. But yes, you're not expected to just drink your drink. A drink is too wet. You need to yes. have something to eat with it. Yep. Yep. And that's one and of the... That was one of the really cool things when I was, you know, when I was in Spain, because the states, they don't they don't really do that where you, they just keep on putting up plates of, of really good like food and local keep, food, and, and locally it's lo produced local food. food and it's all free. And they're like, uh, you know, here you order a drink and then here come the tapas. And I'm yeah. like, wow. And all the all of the pubs did that. And I was like, yeah. this is really awesome. You don't even have to buy food here. I would just go to a pub and have a drink. <laughs> Yeah, and every order, every time you order another drink, it's a different tapa. It is, yeah, yeah. That's that's awesome. So, in 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 where you're living, so if you're you're a couple hours north of you, that's really incredibly affordable, where you can buy homes for, like you said, eighteen thousand euro. Yes. Um, when you when you get to places on the coast where you're at or near her, what are the costs for a um, a place down there, like a flat or even and even the rentals? What are they going for? OK, well, you can get in the old parts of town. You can still get Spanish owned properties that have never been done up. So they're still in the original state for about 40,000 euros, about four zero. Mm -hmm. But you will have to spend some money on updating them. Uh, they won't necessarily have the kind of kitchen that you would like. Um, a lot of Andalus kitchens have never had an, had an oven, for example. Mm -hmm. So the local people here, if they wanted to bake something, they would take it to the panaderia. They would take it to the baker. Sure. And after the baker had finished baking his bread, his oven is still warm. You just put your food in and you cook it there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of Spanish kitchens don't have an oven. So yeah, you'll get it quite cheaply, but you'll have to spend some money on updating it and modernizing it. Yeah. Um, I'm sitting now in a, in a very modern apartment, somewhere completely different to where I lived before. And this modern apartment we bought for, it was on the market for 160,000. We got it for 120,000. Mm -hmm. And that's because it was a bank repossession. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, a, a duplex, it's very spacious, it's three bedrooms, it's got a lovely great big roof terrace, um, but that's a good price. Wow. So realistically, you're spending about 160000 mm -hmm. So whatever you can get inland, add 100000 to it on the coast. Yeah. Are you, can, can, are you close to the beach? Yes, I'm just five minutes walk from the beach. I can see the beach from my roof terrace. Wow. Very close. Yeah. And you got and you bought a duplex for that price. Yeah. Do you yeah. do you is it an Airbnb or do you rent it out or? No, we don't rent it out. Um, we used to have a Villa Turistica Alojamiento Rural, which is basically an Airbnb. We used to have one of those inland and we would rent that out for 48 euros a night. Mm -hmm. So out of season, you can get some great bargains on the on the coast, but inland it's really cheap prices all year yeah uh, because it's not dependent upon school holidays inland people don't expect children to go on holiday inland mm -hmm. so the price there's no fluctuation between summer and winter it's the same price all year mm -hmm. whereas you come to the costa del sol you'll pay a lot of money in the summer in the winter it'll be prices will be slashed so for example i was looking for myself um i've got a wedding coming up so i wanted to stay overnight and that was in Alicante, which is, again, one of the very tourist areas on the southwest coast of Spain. I love Alicante. And that was reduced from, I think it was 80 euros a night in the summer down to 20 euros a night for this month, for mm. October. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it drops significantly as soon as the summer months disappear. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And a rule of thumb over here in Spain, um, whatever you would pay as a holiday rental for a week. So say, for example, you pay 400 euros a week, you will pay that per month as a long term rental. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to buy over here, but you want to rent long term, 
then just check out the local holiday prices and that will give you an idea of what you should be paying per month for a long-term rental. Gotcha. So if you want to, if you want to stay there for a period of time, there's a lot of people doing the, the, the there's a big digital nomad movement now where people yeah. are working from their computers. They're living, they're living in all parts of the world. But if you decide to say, I want to, I want to call Spain home. Um, what are the requirements? I mean, did, the, uh, obviously you have to make a certain amount of money or you have to show a certain amount. There's visa requirements. What are the costs or what kind of, do you have any knowledge on, obviously you do, because you're an expat or you're an immigrant over there. <laughs> I corrected myself. Um, so, I mean, what's, re what's required if you want to live there? It really depends on where you're coming from. So um, if you're coming from the UK, for example, we've now got Brexit. So you have to jump through a whole load more hoops than you had to before. And just going off on a tangent, because of Brexit, a lot of the um, immigrants from the UK have now left Spain. So there is a lot of property around at the moment that was British owned. So it's a really good time to tap into that market if you want to hmm. buy. Hmm. Um, but if you're coming from from Canada or USA, then there are visa requirements. Um, I don't know specifically what they are because they do vary from country to country. Mm -hmm. um, but the information is very easy to find. And I can find you some links if that's helpful to anybody or anybody can just reach out to me. And if yeah. I don't know the answer, I've got plenty of friends locally from different nationalities and I can just point you in their direction so we can yeah. get some answers for you. But yes, you need to have um, some kind of health care, health cover. It's, it's quite cheap, comparatively cheap over here in Spain. Because I have my own business, I have my own registered self-employed business, I am autonomo or autonoma. Um, I pay into the system, so I'm on the Spanish health care. Spanish mm. health care is absolutely free. But uh, wherever you're from, if you have an accident or emergency here in Spain, you do not pay for your, for your um, treatment. They will treat an accident or emergency for free. Wow. Uh, if you then go on to have to have, I don't know, an operation or something, then you might find your health insurance kicks in. But initially, they just treat you for free, which is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So do you do you pay per month for health care there? Yes, I do. I pay per month. Um, I started off three years ago paying 60 euros, and I now pay about 300 euros. But that covers absolutely everything. So that's my my national contribution. It's my stamp, my health care, it's everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had occasion to use the health service. I've had a few operations while I've been here. I've had appendicitis, that was mm -hmm. emergency. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a, a spinal implant. Um, I've had a skin, two skin cancers as well. Mm -hmm. Everything has been completely free. The hospitals here are immaculate. Yeah. You have two people to a room, and this is the National Health Service. Two mm -hmm. people to a room. Your family can come and stay in the same room as well. Costs nothing. You have your own nutritionalist. The room is deep cleaned every day. The service here is really, really good. The healthcare is excellent. Can't fault it. Mm -hmm. So you went from you went from 60 to, to 300. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. Was there a difference in, in what was covered? No, this is because when you start off with a new business, there's a sliding scale. So it's all part of the system. So you start off initially with a low payment and then I'm on maximum payments now after three years. So okay. it's all it's all part of the system. Um, that is a high payment. That is higher than anything I would have had to pay in the UK, for example. Yeah. So Yes, but. All in all, I, I get good value for money, good cover. It, it sounds like, is it based on how, how much you make or your business brings in or no? No, it isn't. Just, no, just over no. time that you, this, once you reach a certain period of time, yeah, then they're going to yeah. raise it. Yeah. But I, I know from uh, friends coming over here that you can get really good health cover for about 60 euros a month mm -hmm. and that will cover you for everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. How, how much if, if you go out for an, a dinner at a local um, Spaniard restaurant, how much do you typically pay for it for a dinner today? Well, as I say, my parents are over here. So we've been out and about recently and we, we're eating out the four of us, having a few drinks, having two courses, eating as much as we can. And we're not paying more than 60 euros for the four of us. Mm -hmm. So that's 
very, very good value. Very yeah, good yeah. Value. Yeah, that's... A paella, that... paella will cost you about 10 euros a, a raffian, a portion. Mm -hmm. um, sardines, 7 euros 50. And that's a huge, great big plate. So lots of fresh fish, locally caught fish. Mm. Um, yeah, it's very reasonable. Or compare it from what I would pay in the UK. I don't know about America, but yeah. It's... Yeah, yeah. What's your favorite dish over there? Oh, today I had flamenquin. And flamenquin for this particular recipe, everybody's got their own. It was hard boiled egg with wrapped in cheese with serrano ham wrapped around that. And then wrapped around that is chicken. And then it's all fried in breadcrumbs. Oh, delicious. <laughs> I love talking about food. How how are, do you eat do you eat paella often? Oh, I love paella. Absolutely love it. And we've got so many different varieties here. So you can have the traditional morisco, the seafood. Uh, you can have rabbit. You can have pork. You can have chicken. You can have completely vegetarian. They mm. will make your paella however you want it. Mm. Yeah. And it's always served with sangria. Oh, love sangria. <laughs> Absolutely love sangria. Or the local white sherry. That is gorgeous. Chilled white sherry. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about um, living, so we got some ideas about um, in your neck of the woods down on the coast um, and a little bit north of you, about two hours. But how about like, you know, a lot of people when they go to Spain, a lot of people travel to Barcelona. Mm -hmm. It's a huge destination and mm -hmm. people go to Madrid. Mm -hmm. So do you have any idea what the cost is there for a place for like in a, like a flat, if you were going to purchase a flat in Madrid or Barcelona? I haven't looked, so I don't know, but I've been to both those places. Um, and I've rented kind of holiday accommodation there and it's been quite affordable. Um, what I would say about eating out though is, if you want to eat out, that's absolutely great. And if you want to people watch, fantastic. But if you want to do it on a budget, step off the main boulevard, step off the main street, go into the back streets and look for where the local people are eating. Mm -hmm. You'll get much better food because it will be locally sourced and locally cooked rather than something that's just served for the tourists. And it will be much, much cheaper. Mm -hmm. Also, it's a bit like in Paris where if you want to sit out on the street and people watch, you actually pay extra. If you go and stand at the bar, the price can be cheaper. Mm -hmm. So check that out as well. Try standing at the bar and you should get a cheaper meal and a cheaper drink. Okay. But price, prices for buying properties, I don't know because I've not had that experience, so I couldn't yeah. tell you. Yeah. And I think, you know, the one thing that I, I think it's advantageous to, to, to be there because I think that once you, if you're there and you're on the pulse of when things are becoming available, and I think that there's also, you can negotiate. And you, when, if people know who you are, you know some of the locals, um, and it, it just helps in the process of purchasing property, I think. Oh, absolutely. And never, ever believe the advertised price. Yes. Never. Always offer about two thirds below what they're, what they're advertising. And usually you're going to get yourself a bargain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Never believe the advertised price. Well, I would love to score a, a duplex like you with a terrace. I mean, that sounds terrific with the with a um, view of the Mediterranean. That's incredible. Yeah, we've got mountains behind us. We've got the sea to the front. Listen, next time you're here, you're going to have to come up and we'll have a barbecue on the sun terrace. I would so love that, but you'd never get rid of me. I'd be That's that okay. guest. I'd, I'd be that guest that never leaves. I'd be sorry, <laughs> Debbie. I, you, you know, did you ever see the movie? What about Bob? With yes. Bill see, I'm, I'd be like that. I'd be like, I'd move right in and I'd like, you guys would be trying to get rid of me. And I go, no, sorry. I, I'll just sleep up here in a terrace. <laughs> You'd be so welcome. You'd be very welcome. <laughs> so how did, so how do you get around um, what's your main mode of transportation? Do you bike? Do you walk? Do you have a vehicle? What, do you, what are people doing down there? And 
Um, Here in the village, I walk. I walk everywhere. I love walking. Um, because in the south coast of Spain, the, the mountains go right down to the sea, it's quite difficult to cycle unless you don't mind cycling like this. So a lot of people here have electric bikes. They have those hybrid bikes. And that's one of the most popular ways of getting around on the hybrid electric bike. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm traveling to a wedding, for example, then I'll, I'll definitely go by car because I need to get there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, but fuel here is, is fairly reasonable. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And they, and, and did they have like taxis and Uber? Yeah, there's Uber here. There's what we have, blah, blah car. Do you have blah blah car where you are? We don't know. No? Okay, blah blah car. If I'm going for a wedding between here and I'm going to drive to Sevilla, to Seville, for example, mm -hmm. which is about three hours drive, then I'll put onto blah blah car. This is my journey. This is when I'm going to be leaving. And if somebody wants to join me, then they will contribute to the fuel. Oh, wow. So I get a bit of company on my journey, and yeah. half of my fuel is, is paid for. So yeah. blah blah car. That works very well. That's a great, that is a terrific concept. There's just so many amazing, innovative concepts just being created constantly. There's you know? a really cool website. It's called Rome to Rio. So Rome, the number two, rio.com, Rome to Rio.com. And you can type in where you're leaving and where you want to go to, and it will list for you how much it will cost by taxi, by bus, by plane, by train. It will list all the different um modes of transport of getting there and it costs it all out for you so that's really good rome to rio rome to rio are people do you do you ever jump on a euro rail do people still do that or are they mainly driving and flying once they move there do you ever know the, 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 the train system is really good and we have a high speed we have the rent the high speed train which is superb it's excellent it literally flies through the countryside so that's good Mm -hmm. um, I recently went to Barcelona for a wedding and I flew. I did an internal flight. So an internal flight from Malaga to Barcelona on the same day there and back was about 40 euros. Mm -hmm. Cheap as chip. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you get do you fly much around um, to, to other countries like Paris or or, uh, you know, France, Italy, um, Portugal? I do get invited. Portugal, we can just drive to. I went on holiday to Portugal. It was four yeah. hours away, four yeah. hours in the oh, car. Oh, okay. So, um, and Spain, uh, sorry, France is very easy to drive to from Spain mm. as well. Mm. Um, so if I'm going to be traveling, I usually go by car because we're quite in Central Europe here. So it's quite easy to drive to different places. If I'm going to Africa, I'll take the ferry. Mm -hmm. If I'm going back to the UK, then I'll take the plane. Take the okay. Yeah. How how are the how are the flight costs to to the UK? Oh, again, anything from about twenty depends when you travel, obviously time of year, but anything from about twenty euros to one hundred and twenty euros. Mm -hmm. But it's still very affordable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Lots of budget airlines are still working. Thank goodness, post pandemic, they're still hanging on in there. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you just a couple more questions here. So what, what, do, you, what do you like the most about living in Spain? The what climate, is the, 100%. The Stop climate. you right there with climate. Love it. We've got 320 days of sunshine on average in the Costa Tropical. Uh, it never freezes. We never have frost. It's lovely. Uh, we have avocados and bananas and oranges and mangoes and all the tropical fruits growing here in our little microclimate. Mm -hmm. So I love it. And when we do have a cold day, it's a novelty. And when it yeah. rains, we all go and dance in the rain. Yeah, yeah. We need the water. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And then, and then, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that think about doing what you've done. And very, very few, I think very few do it. So, I, you know, deciding to leave your, the country that you originate from and go live um, in a different country, how has, that, how has that experience changed you as a person? Mm, great question. Um, it's one of those feel the fear and do it anyway experiences. And for me, because I didn't speak any Spanish when I got here, 
And remember, I moved into a community where nobody spoke any English. Um, that was probably the biggest shock. And I had to go out there and speak like a three-year-old for about two years. And so you're speaking like a three-year-old and people think you have the mentality of a three-year-old and they speak back to you as a three-year-old. So that was quite difficult. So if you can learn the language before you come out, then you'll have a head start on anybody that can't speak the language from scratch, so, you know, like me. So definitely go out there and learn the language because that can be quite a culture shock if you're moving inland to the cheaper areas mm -hmm. because there will be very few people that speak your language. You're going to have to get in there. And also Andalus is a very strong accent. Mm -hmm. So they don't pronounce their S's. And those of you that do speak Spanish know that the end of the verb is quite important to know who you're talking about. And if there's no S, it can be very confusing. We don't live in España. We live in España, for example. Mm. So, oh, um, yeah, for, for me, the biggest change was the, the language. And even though I'm a fairly intelligent person, being uh, treated almost as a, you know, a, um, somebody who is not of my intelligence for a while. Yeah, yeah. That's quite wow. difficult. That was inter that's interesting. I, I also noticed, you know, when I was in Spain that, you, you know, the first thing you notice is that there, you know, growing up in the States, you learn how to say um, uh, gracias with the C-I-A-S, uh, gracias. Then you get to Spain and it's with, with a T-H, a gracias, you know, and it's... Or in Andalusia, gracias. Yeah, gracias. Yeah. And it's like, uh, so, in, in the, so it's that, and I was told, by, you know, by um, friends of mine in, in Spain that... Uh, it was because a, 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 a king or something had a lisp. <laughs> I, have you ever heard that? No, story? but it could be true. It could you know, be. But I was always wondering, you know, that I asked, I go, well, why is it only in Spain that it's like with a, like a TH? You know, don't they say like cerveza, cerveza, cerveza? Cerveza, cerveza. Cerveza, yeah, cerveza. You know, <laughs> so it's a there's a different pronunciation and they said that there was a there was a rumor that a king had a lisp and that's <laughs> how it, i love that that's, that's, that's how brilliant. it stuck i don't i don't know it's still a mystery yeah. i think they have regional dialects like everywhere and they have their own regional words for things as well so when i was inland my vocabulary was kind of built around building and building materials and the things that the workmen would say to each other and then I came here onto the coast and I was trying to use that language with the people that did work on our duplex. What is she talking about? Mm. And we have a completely different word for that. Yeah. So, yes, there are regional variations as well. Now, De Debbie, this is uh, pretty much um, my last question. But when you first moved to, to Spain, you, you weren't working as a celebrant, correct? Correct. And... So you you got you got to Spain. You were obviously figuring out a way to make a living, but then you said you saw an op open door and an opportunity to do this, and you you ran it and you started you started this business and you're obviously in incredibly terrific at it. Um, how, I mean, do most people that move to Spain do they? I'm guessing that there's probably not a lot of opportunities to work in Spain and find work. So I'm guessing you have to create it yourself. Is that correct? Yes. When we moved inland, we had very, very little money. So as I say, we spent 48,000 euros buying an olive farm. It was very run down. It had no running water, no bathroom, no nothing. And we didn't have the money to pay anybody to do it up. So we had to learn to do it up ourselves. And that was probably the best thing ever because it made us reach out to the community and ask for help and connect with them. And um, they embraced us very, very quickly. Um, but not having any money was an issue. Our idea was that we would find a property and we would do up an, like an Airbnb part and that would generate income. But there was that intervening period. So my partner is an English teacher. So we went to the local family run Spanish Academy and said, look, does anybody want to learn English? And we started teaching teachers. Mm -hmm. So they had English teachers who 
couldn't really speak English. Mm -hmm. So we started teaching. So teaching is one thing that you can do. Sure. So if you can get a, a qualification to teach English as a foreign language, go for it. TEFL yeah. or TESOL, go for it. Yeah, yeah. And that you can do because you are an expert in your own language. Mm. And that will enable you to travel anywhere in Spain and teach. Sure. Um, but unless you speak Spanish, it's very difficult to get a job. Like you say, I had to create my job. Yeah. Uh, because there are lots of really good Spanish people over here that are doing the jobs already. So sure. yeah, you need yeah. to be able to speak the language to, to be able to work as a, as a waiter or in an office or an estate agent. You need to yeah. be able to speak the language. Wow, it sounds you just have been on quite a journey because you took this leap of faith to 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 move to Spain on very little, and then yeah. you move, yeah. And then was there was there something about the UK where you just at at a certain point in your life said, "I just want to get out of here and leave and and go and and why Spain rather than like Portugal or or somewhere else?" Um, I had lived in Portugal previously, um, but I was back in the UK and I met my now partner and it was one of those points in your life I have grown up children and it was one of the points in the life where my children were independent they were okay my parents were fine they were fit and well uh, my partner as well we suddenly had this window of opportunity and we thought life's an adventure it's a journey we can stay where we are and we can be comfortable and muddle along or we can go and do something different, have an adventure together. Now, he already spoke Spanish. Okay. So that's why we started looking at Spanish speaking countries. And we just kept coming back to Spain itself because it was quite easy to get back to the UK from Spain. Um, would I ever go back to the UK? Never. I've burnt mm. my bridges. It's gray. The people are gray, the weather's gray, the buildings are gray, the food's gray. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Britain. <laughs> hey, man, they have. So, yeah, I pop back and I visit my grandchildren. But uh, yeah, I, I would never move back there. Yeah. Well, th thank you. Um, thank you, Debbie Skirm. Thank you so much for being my guest today and, and sharing your journey and your experience and living in Spain and all of the insights and tips you gave us. Um, congratulations on, on your Celebrant Spain business and being awarded the best Celebrant in Europe. That is incredible. Thank you. That, Thank that, you is, really, that is really incredible. And I can, just by interviewing you, I can see why you would be awarded that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So thank you so much for being a part of this. I appreciate it. And um, well, thank and you for the opportunity. And if anybody does want to reach out any social media, just type in Celebrant Spain. Then ta -da! Yep. And if you want to find my website, it's celebrantspain.es for España. Yeah. Fine. And we're going to add all that at the end of this podcast so that when it's posted on YouTube, people will see that as well. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Debbie, I'm really thank you. I'm passionate about raising the profile of Spain as a destination wedding location. And this has been the perfect platform. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Well, enjoy the rest of the time with your, your parents. And thanks again. And um, have a great day. Thank you.